You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and of sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the narrow mind. Tuesday night, February 21st. My name is Gene Cook. Welcome to the broadcast of The Narrow Mind. I am, uh, I had actually decided not to do the broadcast tonight. And uh, I changed my mind because there's quite a few people on the website. So I figured I'd open up the mic. The reason why I decided not to do the broadcast tonight is because uh, I'm not feeling too well. Well, that's part of it. I'm not feeling very well. And uh, the other part of it is that uh, I tried to up update my my media player today my iTunes player which is where I have all the playlists and the songs and everything for narrow mind and uh, I guess what happened was that as it was updating to the new version it actually deleted the old version and then it got to a place where it said that it couldn't install the new version and then it was going to revert back to the old version but the old version was no longer old because it was gone so I was a little bit frustrated with that, and uh, at about 5.15, I called my, my friend Doug, who was going to help me with the broadcast tonight, screening the calls. I said, you know, don't bother coming because I'm not feeling good. I'm just going to cancel the program. And then I looked at the website, and there was about 22 people on the website. So I figured, well, let's see if we can pull something together. So uh, here we are. I don't know what happened to the 22 people, but uh, if they don't come back pretty soon, we may just cut this short. But here, here's the deal for tonight. I don't have a call screener, and so uh, if you call in, I'm basically going to shotgun drop you right into right into queue, and you'll be live on the air. So if you want to call in, <clears throat> and uh, you don't uh, you don't think that you have a good chance of getting through when you're being screened by my screener, I guess tonight would be a good opportunity for you to call. If you want to argue with me, tonight would probably also be <clears throat> a good night for you to call because uh, I'm probably going to scream uncle a lot quicker than I normally would. So, uh, having said that, I want to give out our phone number, 800-466-1873. That is toll free, 1-800-466-1873. Or you can call us on our local line at 619-793-5180. That's 619-793-5180. Now, last week, I had as my guest David Zaduk, who's an elder. He's actually uh, an intern here in San Diego, but he's also an elder at Grace and Truth Church or Grace and Truth Fellowship in Israel. And we were talking about the relationship between Israel and the church and I thought it was kind of interesting coming from somebody who was a Jewish Christian. Uh, that The second hour of that broadcast is available on our website for free download if you'd like to check that out. Uh, it was, I, I think, an interesting, informa- uh, interesting interview, interesting dialogue that I had with him. Toward the end of the program there, we had a, uh, a man call. He was from Virginia. I can't recall what his, his name was. And he called and um, he basically took issue with my position. He was a dispensationalist, and so uh, if you're a dispensationalist, you would take issue with my position, and and also the position of my guest. And basically, the position that I'm discussing here, the the position that I'm referring to, is the uh, position uh, that you might call the engrafting of the Gentiles, which I think is, is, I mean, it's a no-brainer. It's biblical. And uh, what it is is, in a nutshell, if you're unfamiliar with it or you didn't listen to either last week's program or the week before, uh, the the Gentiles in the New Covenant, you know, God's working with Israel in the Old Covenant, primarily working with Israel. And in the New Covenant, the, uh, the gospel now is extended to not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And so it, we're, we're told in the book of Romans that the Gentiles are now grafted into 
the olive tree. Uh, the olive tree, I think, uh, being the covenant of God, uh, the body of Christ. So you've got uh, you've got Jewish branches, natural branches, that are broken off because of unbelief, and then you've got uh, Gentiles who are grafted in by faith. And then we're told that you know God is able to graft back in these other branches, these natural branches, which are referring to Jewish people, if perhaps they should come to faith. Well, I had a. Uh, that's my position that 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 the Gentiles are now grafted into what uh, was formerly exclusively Jewish, now consists of both Jew and Gentile, the body of Christ. Uh, pretty straightforward, pretty basic, yet still a minority view in this country. And uh, toward the end of the program, I had a, a caller call from Virginia, and he basically took issue with what I was saying and said, "No, you know, you're all wrong. You're all wrong." And being a dispensationalist, he, he draws such a sharp distinction between Jew and Gentile that, uh, that what he said was that God had made these unconditional promises to Jews in the, in the Old Testament. Basically, they were referred to and described as land promises. And these land promises were given, and they were given unconditionally. And when he said that, I said, well, you mean unconditionally in Christ, and he very sharply corrected me. He said, don't put words in my mouth. Well, when he said that, I'm assuming that he's disagreeing with me. That uh, the land promises are not unconditional in Christ. I mean, you can go back. You can listen to the file. It's toward the last 15 or 20 minutes. It's there. It's available for free download on our homepage at unchainradio.com. Uh, so a little bit later in the, uh, the broadcast, we're still talking about the issue. And of course, we're disagreeing. And he says, you know, that... that uh, he brings up this passage from the book of Romans and says, look, God, in fact, let me let me turn to that passage real quick. Romans chapter 11. Uh, by the way, you're listening to uh, The Narrow Mind. My name is Gene Cook. If you'd like to give us a call and talk about uh, what I'm discussing right now, the church in Israel or, or anything else, feel free to call. But if you do call, know this, that uh, I, I don't have a screener tonight because I originally was not going to... Uh, to do the broadcast. Uh, so I will be dropping you in cold turkey. And just so you're aware of that, uh, but you are welcome to call in. Uh, in Romans chapter 11, it says, da, 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 where is it at? Mm-hmm. Here we go. Romans chapter 11, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive, referring to Gentiles, of course, were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will then say the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. And then he, he says in, in Romans eleven twenty three, and they also, if they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Uh, if they do not continue in their unbelief, which means that they have to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the only promises that are given to man in the Bible, are promises, that is, promises of blessing, whether it's land or anything else, the only promises that are given are given in Christ. So you, you have to be in Christ. Now, uh, my dispensational caller last week from Virginia, I think his name might have been Steve or Jerry or something like that. I can't remember. I'm sorry. I haven't listened to it again. But uh, he, he, he said, well, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, of course, if they're going to be saved, they have to come to Christ. But I, I think he was implying that the land promises were somehow uh, available outside of Christ. Well, I can remember, uh, and I'm just going to do a search on my, on my internet right now, uh, on my Google, my Google search, because um, uh, I can remember reading a book. And it was entitled, The Church is Israel Now. Do a search. There it is. Okay. 
If you do a search for the church is Israel now, the very first link that you will find in Google is this publication called The Church is Israel Now. Section 1, The Church is Israel Now. Old Testament titles and attributes of Israel which are in the New Testament refer to the Christian church. Now, the first uh, it, it's kind of in an outline form. It's got tons of scripture. I'd encourage you to check this out. Okay, this is irrefutable church, uh, irrefutable proof. First of all, the beloved of God. Point A, Israel is the beloved of God. Exodus 15, 13, Deuteronomy 33, Ezra 3, 11. 3, 11. Disobe disobedient Israel is not the beloved of God. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine verses to support that. Disobedient Israel is not the beloved of God. C, Christians are the beloved of God. Romans 1, 7, Romans 1, 9, Ephesians 5, 1, Colossians 3, 12. So, beloved of God, believing Israel, Old Testament, beloved of God, disobedient Israel, not the beloved of God, Christians, beloved of God. Secondly, children of God. Israelites are the children of God. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six verses from the Old Testament, Exodus 4.22, Daniel 14.1, Isaiah 1.2, Isaiah 1, 4, Isaiah 63, 8, Israel, Israelites are the children of God. B, disobedient Israelites are not the children of God. Deuteronomy 32, 5, John 8, 39, you are of your father, the devil, remember? Harsh words by Jesus. C, lo and behold, Christians are the children of God. So, recap, Israelites are the children of God. Disobedient Israelites, not the children of God. Christians are the children of God. Field of God. Israel is called the field of God, Jeremiah 12.10. Christians are called the field of God, 1 Corinthians 3.9. You're starting to get where I'm going with this. I can remember reading this and uh, literally, well, I guess not literally, but Almost literally, falling out of my chair. Why didn't somebody show this to me earlier? Well, it's quite simple. I was going to a dispensational church. You don't, you don't talk about these things in dispensational churches. The flock of God and of the Messiah. Israel is the flock of God. Psalm 78, 52. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 verses to prove that Israel is the flock of God and of the Messiah. Christians are the flock of God and of the Messiah. John 10, 14, John 10, 16, Hebrews 13, 20, 1 Peter 2, 25, 1 Peter 5, 2, and 3. Flock of God. House of God. Israel is the house of God. Christians are the house of God. Chosen people. Israel is the chosen people of God. Christians are the chosen people of God. Lo and behold, disobedient Israelites are not the chosen people of God. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven verses to prove that disobedient Israelites are not the chosen people of God. Um, sound convincing? Circumcised. I can go on and on and on. In fact, I'm going to go on and on until somebody calls. So if you want to hear me stop talking about this, just call me and I'll talk about something else. The circumcised. Israelites are the circumcised of God. Genesis 17.10. Judges 15.18. Disobedient Israelites are not the circumcised of God. Romans 2.25 and 28. Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26. Lo and behold, Christians are the circumcised of God. Romans 2, 29. Philippians 3, 3. Colossians 2, 11. 
Hmm. Israel. Israel is Israel. Disobedient Israel is not Israel. Point number three. Christians are Israel. Let's let's take a moment with this one. Okay. Israel is Israel. That's a given, right? Okay. Point number two. Disobedient Israelites are not Israelites. Seems like it'd be a hard one to prove. Romans 9, 6 says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are a descendant of Israel. And for you anti-Calvinists out there that just love to argue against Calvinism and and say that uh, Romans 9 is speaking of nations, how is it then that they who are not all Israel are descended from Israel? What nation is that describing? Uh, Israel is not Israel, or not all Israel is Israel. Disobedient Israel is not Israel. Let's put it that way. Uh, let's see what this other verse here says. Acts 3.23. Are my phones working? My phones are working. 1-800-466-1873. Toll free. We're making it easy for you tonight. 1-800-466-1873. You don't like what I'm saying? You disagree with what I'm saying? Like I said, tonight would probably be a good night uh, to put me in a theological arm bar because I'm not feeling good. In fact, I was going to cancel the program. But, you know, I, I kind of have a, a renewed uh, spirit tonight, I guess. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling better. Drinking my cold water here. Feeling pretty good. Even though nobody's calling, still feeling pretty good. Acts 3.23. Acts 3.23 says, And it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed among the people. Now that's a quote from the Old Testament. That's Acts 3.23. Uh, that's in reference to uh, the words of Peter where he says in verse 22, The Lord God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. Him you shall give heed to in everything that he says to you, and it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. In other words, you're going to be cut off. You're an Israelite. This prophet comes, the one coming after Moses, the one like Moses. You don't listen to him. You're cut off. And when you're cut off, you're cut off from Israel. Uh, but yet, we're also told that Christians are referred to as Israel. Christians are referred to as Israel. And uh, we will come to that in just a moment. Welcome to the Narrow Mind. Who am I speaking to? Hey, Pastor Cook. Is this uh, Arthur? Oh, yeah. What's going on, Arthur? Yeah, man, I just had to call and tell you, man. You're wrong, man. You're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, you picked a good night to call. I just had to come and be contrary, man. No. <laughs> well, I figured there had to be somebody out there listening that disagreed with me. So, uh, so uh, which which one of the verses that I read was is wrong? <laughs> no, man, I'm just I'm just uh, kidding with you, man. I'm just okay. <laughs> it's a slow night for you, so I just, I'm just uh, messing with you a little bit. But so you like how I phrased that question? So which one of the verses that I read was wrong? It's kind of like so. When did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> yeah, I just love those complex questions like that. So you <clears throat> sent me an email. Before before you uh, say what you have to say, I just have a question for you. Sure. You, you sent me an email, and you, you, you overheard uh, the infidel guy talking about me. Oh, yeah. and uh, Got it on tape. I, I wish I had a copy of it. Uh, oh, I, I, I was going to make a, an MP3 or something to send it to you. Okay. <laughs> because we can't have the infidel guy just trying to <laughs> take you out without your... Uh, outside of your presence like that. Oh, you mean he wasn't saying nice things about me? <laughs> I thought well, me and he, Reggie were you know tight. Reggie is, but he, him and his guest um, were basically um, 
talking about one of your comments about um, apparently it says something to the effect that why would I believe in Christianity, you know, when there's a hell, because I wouldn't want to believe in that, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's not an exact uh, quote there, but I have it on tape, and I was going to send it to you. So, and they, so they were just, you know, jumping up and down over that documentation. And uh, I said, oh, my goodness, I'll, I'll have to let Pastor Cook hear this one. Yeah, that's funny. I'd like to hear that. Yeah, if you'll send it on to me, I'll, uh, I'll put it up on the website. And then what I'll do is I'll call in uh, to the Infidel Guys program <laughs> and uh, ask him to clarify uh, what, what it was he was saying there. <laughs> so what was he saying? That I just believe things blindly? Um, not so much that you believe things blindly, but they were trying to t basically take apart your reasoning behind saying that, you know, um, well, I wouldn't believe Christianity. Believe, why would I believe in Christianity? Um, and again, I'm just going from memory because it's a little clouded right now, but it was over the doctrine of hell and, and um, something to the effect that you wouldn't rationally believe that if it wasn't true, you know, mm. that kind of thing. So they were basically trying to take apart your reasoning. Yeah, but it is true, so I have to rationally believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it's, it's, it, it, was, it was weird, man, I, and uh, I have to make an MP3 of that for you. Sure, I appreciate Just that. That little section. Yeah, I, I like Reggie, although I disagree with him. Uh, he, he's, he, I mean, you know... Uh, I'm hoping that one of these days he'll he'll wake up, and I mean spiritually wake up. So, but uh, so what's on your mind tonight? Uh, no, I, I definitely agree with you uh, on that because I was thinking maybe I could uh, <clears throat> maybe we could get him on your show, the uh, the atheist hour. Yeah, we could do that. Or uh, we can kind of double team him and, and call in on his show. <laughs> <laughs> double team him, double team him with the truth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's so, talk about that. We, we could we can call him up and and uh, ask him to clarify what he was uh, saying there. Yeah. Him, him and actually his guest was a, an atheist lawyer uh, from the L.A. area. Oh, that would be Edward Tabosh. That's Mr. Tabosh. Eddie. I call him Eddie the Tomahawk Tabosh. Yeah. I Eddie. just finished wrestling him and and uh, and Reggie <laughs> and a caller. Yeah, I I'd, I'd, like hear, I'd like to hear that too. Uh, Oh, yeah, I just put it up on my website. <laughs> yeah, Eddie, Eddie Tabash's argument for atheism is simple. <laughs> what is it? A, a lot of bad things happen in this world, so there couldn't be a God. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that was basically it. <clears throat> yeah. Which, of so, course, you know, I took, I took that apart real quick as special pleading. <laughs> because yeah. a lot of good things happen in the world, too. What does that mean? Yeah, it's amazing he could be a successful attorney with uh, that type of evidence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that was a part of the issue. But uh, I'm a little upset with Reggie because he, he, before I got to finish my point, when I was uh, dealing with him and Tabash, uh, when I was talking about evidence and so on and so forth and how my point was going to be, uh, and I don't think Reggie cut me off intentionally, at least I hope he didn't, but before I got to finish my point, was that, you know, the evidence for God is out there, mm -hmm. you know, both in, in, in the world and, of course, you and I would argue that God is using us and other Christians to reach people like Reggie. Yeah. But it's how they subjectively interpret that evidence is, the, is what the problem is. Mm -hmm. You see, it's just like, uh, for example, I think there's still a flat earth society out there. You right. know? Yeah. Well, there's, uh, a, there's, cool. a group, there's a group of people that say that we didn't land on the moon. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and and there's, a, there's a, uh, I believe, still a flat earth society out there small group of people, but, you know, the evidence is there. It's all, you know, pretty much overwhelming that the earth is not flat yet. Um, well, I've only, I've, I haven't, I've only seen pictures. And, you know, pictures can be doctored up. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's probably some of the reasoning that they use. So I really can't believe that the, that the earth isn't flat because it appears flat. You know, these other people say that they've, I mean, you, we're basically going off of, of, of the testimony of other people, the testimony of men, when we can see that the world is round. What, and you know as well as I do, Arthur, that the testimony of men is just unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I need to find out if there's a chapter in my neighborhood. 
<laughs> flat, earth, flat Earth Society, huh? Yep. Flat Earth Society. Of course, and, I'm being oh, completely uh, sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek when I say that. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's my point. So their problem is very simple. You know, they are, you know, rejecting the evidence or finding creative ways to reject the evidence. And that's, you know, one of the biggest problems with uh, atheists and atheism is, is the creativity they have. And the ironic thing is, you know, these guys, as I thought about it, these guys are like walking, walking oxymorons. They're using creativity to deny the, <laughs> the creator. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, Reggie, uh, Reggie has this elaborate creative website. <laughs> <laughs> like Van Til says, uh, Van Til, Cornelius Van Til says that uh, uh, for a child to slap his father in the face, his father must first lift him into his lap. <laughs> and uh, the analogy is that uh, if if man is going to argue against God, first God has to give him the ability to do so by uh, creating him with a, a mind and a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, that that's just kind of what some stuff that's been on my, my mind. Um, I've been kind of busy working on some different things, and uh, but I definitely want to send you that, that audio so you can hear uh, what they were saying. Yeah, I would be interested in that. I can send it to you tonight, because I, I thought you might want to just play it on there and then answer it, or go on the show or have them come on and answer it one way or the other. You can answer this, the charges against you. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Yeah, because I, I have that audio. So, <clears throat> In fact, I already have it in my, my computer. I just got to uh, queue it up, turn it into an MP3, and send it to you. Sounds good. Yeah. So, uh, Arthur, are, are you... Uh, I, I've never asked you about this, but are you a dispensationalist? Uh, I, I have to honestly say I, I probably lean towards that. Okay. Mainly because I was taught it early on, but I haven't really, I've never gotten deep into the whole dispensational thing. That's a very safe answer. <laughs> well, it's, 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 <laughs> I'm just teasing you. It, it's an honest answer. I no, mean, I know, I know. Uh, that's where I stand right now. I appreciate that. Yeah. Do you uh, do you ever get on Pal Talk? Oh, yeah, I'm on Pal Talk a lot. In what? fact, I'm teaching Greek on Pal Talk right now. <laughs> Are you really? What, what, is your, what is your screen name on Pal Talk? Is it Top Scholar 1? Yep. Okay. That's it. Okay. I thought I've seen you on there before. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching Greek every Monday nights around 5.30 Pacific time. Okay, great. 5, 5.30 to about 7. All right. And so, yeah, I'm on Pal Talk a lot. All right. Um... I'm going to get back to, did you have something else you want to say? Because if not, I want to get back to this uh, outline in Israel that I was going through. Okay, yeah, it sounds like a pretty decent outline. Yeah, it is. I mean, there, it's there's a lot of scripture here. You want to check it out, definitely. Okay, um, I just, one more thing I just had to say, though. When you hit that phone line and, and it, it made that uh, dial tone, that really hurt, man. I was listening to the show. <laughs> <laughs> it worked, though. You called in right after that. Huh? You see how that happens? Yeah, I phoned in because I really wanted to say, Yo, Pastor Cook, that hurt, man. <laughs> okay, I won't do it again. It, it actually hurt. Button, I mean. It actually hurt me too because I've got headphones on. Oh, you got headphones. <laughs> and I, I forgot how loud it was. Yeah, it was loud, man. <laughs> so uh, I woke up our listeners that were were falling asleep. <laughs> no, I wasn't falling asleep. I was just listening. Okay. Like All right, Arthur. Call in, that hurt. It worked, though. You called in, like, right after that. <laughs> you see, I, I, I planted the seed. <laughs> the dial tone seed. Oh, okay. I, I might have to do it again if I don't get any other callers after you. Oh, man, that's funny. All right, let me give out our phone number once again. We'll talk to you later, Arthur. Let me give out our phone number once again. It's 1-800-466-1873. Uh, you can call if you want to talk about something else, that uh, something other than the subject that I'm discussing, that is the relationship between Israel and the church. Uh, you're welcome to call me up. We can talk about anything you like. Uh, 1-800-466-1873 or toll, uh, toll free on my end, that is, 619. If you want to call me on the local num number, 619-793-5180. All right, let's take a look at this. Uh, I was going to read that uh, Christians are called Israel. In this outline, he lists a couple verses here from John chapter 11, verse 50. Um, 
John 11.50. Is that right? Yeah. Let me back up to verse 49. Oh yeah, this is an interesting verse. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. For this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but that he might gather together into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned to kill him. Wow. Now, this is a, a, an interesting passage. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, because Caiaphas is the high priest, and we see that uh, Caiaphas, even in the days of Jesus, is still given the ability to prophesy by the Spirit of God. Not only that, but he says, by the Spirit of God, he says that it's expedient for one man to die for the nation. And then he goes on, or John goes on, Actually, he goes on. No, no, I take that back. John, the, the author, goes on to explain and clarify, of course, also by the Spirit of God. Now, this he said not his own initiative. But he also says in verse 52, for not for the nation only, but that he might also gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Into one what? Into one nation. How many nations does God have? Well, if you, if you reject my conclusions here, you're going to have to uh, say that God has two nations. He has a physical nation and a spiritual nation. Well, I think you're going to have a problem with that because the uh, New Testament tells me that God only has one nation, and that is the chosen nation, the royal priesthood. We'll come back to this in a minute. we got another call. Welcome to The Narrow Mind. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Deacon Fred, and I'm calling from Greensboro, North Carolina. Deacon Fred, uh, I thought uh, you were told never to call this program again. Hold on just a second. Give me the phone back, preacher. Pastor Cook, I was hearing you tonight talking about those uh, dad blame premillennials. And uh, I just want to thank you, brother, for converting my pastor to an all-millennial brother. Uh, I've been waiting for many years. Fred, get off the phone. Gene, I'm sorry about that. Fred is just out of control tonight. We're okay. still having a problem with our toilet here in North Carolina. The I water's thought... kind of backed up, and septic system isn't running well. So, But anyways, on a lighter note, uh, I was listening to you talk about... Um, the issue about the physical promises of the land. Mm -hmm. And I just got finished listening to the uh, show from last week. I'm a little late on listening to it. Okay. But one of the things that I think really, really has helped me get a handle on this is looking at the fulfillment of a lot of the Old Testament passages in the New Covenant. For example, um, we look at uh, Amos chapter 9, verse 11 mm -hmm. through 13. Let me turn there quickly. Okay. I'll be reading it out of the uh, New American Standard, updated 1995 edition. So if, if you guys don't have that, you're in trouble. That's the um, NASAU. That's right, brother. That's the one that I have in my Bible software program. Absolutamente. PC Study Bible. Shameless plug. Well, I don't know about all that, but yeah, something like that. Anyways, Amos 9, verse 11 says, In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine, and all the hills will be dissolved. Well, you look at these at these verses. These verses are talking about the physical restoration of Israel mm -hmm. after it's been basically turned into shambles. 
um, because God poured out his judgment on Israel in about 722 B.C. um, as a form of judgment against them for falling into idolatry. Yet, we look in the New Testament in Acts chapter 15. And let me just say while you're turning there. Yep. If you're calling into the program, uh, I need you just to allow the phone to continue to ring until your call is picked up because um, I I told my screener not to come over tonight because I wasn't feeling well. And I decided to go through it forward with the show. So uh, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, Is it Deacon Fred? (laughs) No, I I got him off the phone. I just Sometimes he tries. To, he does a really good job of portraying my voice, mm-hmm. and he gets me in a lot of trouble doing that. So, just you know, sometimes when you get a call uh, from Greensboro, North Carolina, and it sounds like me, it may not be me. So, just he's very good at doing that. Well, he just called for me mind. last time he called. He was at the adult daycare center. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, wow. that's, how, that's how we know it's him. It says on our well, call screen. Well, he, he does have some issues. I mean, we're working with him. He's, he's, he's saved, brother. He's justified, but he's got some sanctification issues that we're trying to work on. So God bless his little heart. All right. Uh, Acts 15. Yeah. Now, remember Amos 9, mm-hmm. Acts 15. Uh, this is the council at Jerusalem. They're debating the issue, you know, should the Gentiles keep the law? You know what's the distinction uh, between them and the and the they're coming into the kingdom. God's saving them right and left. Should they have to keep the law? Well, James says this. He says in verse thirteen, after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, "Brethren, listen to me. Simon is related how God first concerned Himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for His name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen." Mm-hmm. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those returning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from the things contaminated by idols, and from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood. Now, he just quoted Amos chapter 9, and when I look at that passage back in its original context, that's talking about a restoration of the physical nation of Israel. Yep. But when I look at it here, James says, no, this is talking about, he interprets Amos to say that God does save Gentiles and that they too should be included in the people of God. Yeah, the uh, the body of Christ. Yes. Fallen it's not talking about a literal restoration, a physical restoration, um, but he he believed that at that time, that that prophecy that Amos had prophesied in the 700, B, you know, almost 700 years earlier, mm-hmm. was actually taking place in the first century A.D. He believed that the reunification and restoration of Israel was happening right before his eyes. That's right. And it clearly wasn't a national reunification because it included non-Israelites, and Israel, the nation, was securely under the thumb of Rome at that time. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's so a very that's powerful verse. So that's just something I've been looking at. Um, you know, the last the last week or so, but and of course we all know the famous passage in Jeremiah thirty three, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter eight. Yep. We look in you know that's a big passage that's debated amongst between Presbyterians and Baptists, but we look in Jeremiah thirty three verse fourteen, especially verse fourteen. It, it goes on later. But it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord our righteous. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priest shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offering, to burn grain offerings, and to prepare sacrifices continually. Now, the premillennials will interpret that as uh, obviously the millennial sacrifices yeah. that will take place. Mm-hmm. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant for the day, and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne, and with the Levit- Levitical priests my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be counted, 
The sand of the sea cannot be measured, so will I multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. Now, when I look at this passage again in the original context, it seems to talk about a literal uh, fulfillment of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, Mm -hmm. and that God will cause a righteous branch of David, the Messiah, to spring forth, and he'll execute justice and righteousness, and Judah will be saved, Jerusalem will dwell in safety. But when I look in the New Covenant era, I find that this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And That's right. when I find that when I find that fulfilled, I look in um, Luke chapter one, for example. Um, I see that in Luke chapter one, they were these people were looking for the consolation of Israel, which of course was was Jesus. Mm-hmm. Look at verse thirty two. It says, "And he will be great." Talking about Jesus, he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Mm-hmm. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Yeah. So is clearly that, they, that the interpreted, about... they, they, they thought that that was going to be a uh, military uh, leader or conqueror. But when we look at the references to the branch, Jesus as the righteous branch, we see that fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. And according to the language of the text, the Messiah will be doing just what is uh, just and right in the land of Palestine. He will save Judah physically, and Jerusalem will be safe from her enemies in the Old Covenant context. Mm -hmm. But we look in the New Covenant context of Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it says, he lived in what was called Nazareth, and this was fulfilled what was spoken to the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And um, basically what that's saying is that Jesus would come into the land, and he would save a, a, a spiritual people to himself. He would bring people to himself and uh, save them um, through the fulfillment found in the New Covenant. Amen. So... That's good stuff. In fact, I think uh, I'm going to uh, address the issue of dispensationalism over the next several weeks, Lord willing, yeah. because this is such an important issue. And I know a lot of our listeners are actually dispensationalists. Um, I know we've got some guys, at least two of them that I know of, that are attending Dallas Theological Seminary. So, right. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. You know, what's interesting about you mentioned uh, Jesus sitting on David's throne. Yes. That passage from Acts chapter 2. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's where I was getting ready to go next. Yeah, Acts chapter 2, Peter is there preaching on the day of Pentecost. Yep. And uh, he, he says something just completely remarkable that when I understood it, it really blew me away. Right. He says, uh, he's talking about David, and he says, uh, brethren, Verse 30. Yeah, I, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now, he, he just got done quoting out of the Old Testament, uh, where God said that he was going to uh, right. seat David on his, or he was going to, you know, revitalize David's throne. He was going to uh, not abandon David's soul to to Hades, nor allow his Holy One to undergo decay. Right. Peter comes back and says, look, David is, is in the dirt. He's buried. Yep. You can go check out his grave if you want. There's his tomb. Mm-hmm. And then it says in verse 30, and so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That's right. Wow. Yeah, Jesus is on the throne reigning right now. Yeah, David's throne. Yeah, and he's reigning through the resurrection of Christ. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Mm-hmm. Now, that's interesting because that that gets back to... The real problem I had with the whole issue, because I, I kind of leaned in the historic pre-mill direction for quite a while, and uh, I had some real struggles with this whole issue of the millennial sacrifices. I mean, you've got these Levitical priests um, running around, and to me that's just to jump backwards to the types and the shadows. Yep. Hebrews 10.1 says that all of that, the law was a shadow of the good things which are to come, but the substance is found in Jesus. That's the, the essence of all of Hebrews 10. And when I look at... Um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 through 28, mm-hmm. it says, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Yep. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it is fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, 
who does not need daily like this high priest, offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak. The word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Mm. Forever. It's a word I own in the Greek. Yep. It means from age to age. But it's just some, those are some of the things I've been looking at. And I, I think the passage you just read is very powerful. Because the argument is that, um, that Jesus is not reigning on the throne. We're awaiting that reign. Uh, he's not reigning in the lives of believers now. We're awaiting that reign in the millennial, in the millennial reign of Christ. But I just don't see how they get around Acts chapter 2, verse 30 and 31. Um, because well, that, that kind of sealed it for me. Here, here's the thing. So, to, to think that Jesus is going to uh, get up off of his throne, the, the throne that's at the right hand of the Father, uh, having uh, have, having already been declared Lord of Lords and King of Kings, yeah, and come down and uh, sit on some alleged David's throne, uh, you know, in Tel Aviv, right. yeah, uh, it's just right. utter nonsense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it makes absolutely it, it's it's a re, it's reverting back to, you know. It's reverting back to before the cross. It's going right back to what Hebrews tells us not to go back exactly. to. Exactly. It's going right back to what it tells us not to go back to, and that 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 was always a big, always a big problem for me. So there's a book, I found that very helpful for those guys that may be listening who are dispensational in their approach. Um, you know, check it out. You know, why are we going back to types and shadows when we have the fulfillment here in the here and now? So yeah, I I I, I hear this all the time because I'm in. Uh, the heartland of Calvary Chapel here in Southern California. Right. And I hear, you know, Chuck Smith and these other pastors from Calvary Chapel talking about uh, a reinstitution of the animal sacrifices in Ezekiel's temple in the, yep. the millennium. I, I, I just shake my head and, and people right. call up and, and he says, now remember, you know, they're not going to be for, uh, they're not going to be for atonement. They're going to be just for the purpose of a, a memorial. Just That's the not what of, the Bible says in the Old Testament. No, that's, that's the problem. Right. If you're going to be consistent, you got to take it all away. Mm-hmm. You got to say that those those. If you're going to, and this is the issue I ran into. Why are we offering atoning sacrifices in the millennial kingdom if the greatest sacrifice of atonement that's been made, that sufficient final sacrifice made once for all, according to Hebrews seven, eight, nine, ten, has been offered, and to go back to those those sacrifices, back to the Levitical priesthood, is to go back to the weak and beggarly elements of the law. Why are we doing that in the Millennial Kingdom? Um, Jesus is clearly seen as the resurrected Lord. He is put on the throne. And uh, David uh, was spoken of in Acts chapter 2 as a prophet. And he was, um, his descendant was seated on the throne. And he was speaking of the resurrection of Christ as the one who would reign. And what I was getting at earlier with the issue of uh, the Jeremiah 33 passage. I mean, that promise could not be any any clearer. That promise clearly says that there will be a reign over Israel, Judah, of one of David's descendants, the Messiah. There will be countless Levitical priests that will be ministering in the temple doing sacrifices. Mm-hmm. And that passage bristles with problems without the hermeneutic of reading the Old Covenant through the lens of the New in the picture fulfillment understanding. That's right. Even those messianic promises are, are problematic because that promised king can only be seen in David's line as being fulfilled forever in Jesus Christ. And if you don't see it that way, as the book of Hebrews teaches, and you've got some real issues in going back to those types and shadows in the millennial reign. I just have a real... It, it's just unbelievably problematic. So. You know what's interesting? There's a, uh, there's a book that is written. I actually picked this up at a garage sale. It's yeah. one of those. It's one of those finds that you, uh, you know, uh, at least once or twice in your lifetime stumble upon. Somebody threw it away and didn't know what they were throwing away. Huh? Exactly. It's a paperback book that that you know the you can tell that uh, they typeset the book on a, somebody's typewriter. You yeah. know, that's right. that's how archaic it is. It was written in the seventies, I think. It's by two men. It's called Dispensationalism: Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. Mm. And it's written by two guys who were students at Dallas Theological Seminary right. in Dallas, Texas. And uh, they 
it's 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 great. In fact, I'm going to break it out for these programs that we're going to do. But there's a chapter in there called the Apostles' Hermeneutic, mm. and it, basically it goes over a litany of verses that are in the Old Testament that are now reinterpreted by the apostles in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. For example, um, yep. out of Egypt I will call my son. That's right. Originally, <laughs> originally, what did that apply to? Israel. It was, yeah, it was talking. It was looking back. New Testament talks about Christ. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, you would have never, in the New Testament, it's talking about um, Jesus being called out, to, uh, he and his parents being called out to Egypt. Now, what's interesting is, I just spoke with a guy two weeks ago as a patient of mine. I work in physical therapy, part, mm-hmm. well, full-time and do ministry also. But um, he took that verse, and he's one of these Jesus Seminar guys. And he said, you know what, I read that verse, and he said, I realized that that whole story about Jesus and Joseph and Mary, that where God warned Joseph in a dream to leave because Herod had become angry and the, because the Magi lied to him, and therefore he, he slaughtered the innocents in Bethlehem. And uh, he said, I realized that whole story by reading um, some of the Jesus Seminar guys never actually happened, but it was a story constructed by Matthew to appeal to the Jewish uh, audience that he was uh, writing to. I thought, huh? <laughs> Man, all you got to do is read the new covenant through the lens, or read the, read the old covenant through the lens of the new. Yeah. And I said, what's going on there is the prophecy in the Old Testament from Hosea eleven actually was was indeed in the context pointing back to God calling out His people out of Egypt and rescuing out, rescuing them from the arm or the bondage of Pharaoh, the slavery. Yeah. But also, God had another intention that was unknown to some of the people probably at the time that that was written, and maybe even to the prophet. But God had another intention, and that that would eventually point to his son and his flight uh, to Egypt instead of out of Egypt. That's right. You would have never gotten that in the Old Covenant context, but this guy, because he's, you know, he's influenced by the Jesus Seminar, doesn't understand a proper biblical hermeneutic of reading the Old Covenant through the lens, the greater fulfillment of the New. No. When you read it that way and you understand what the Holy Spirit intended, it makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, you read, for example, um, the promises to Abraham Mm -hmm. that God was going to give him a seed. Yep. Uh, You know, that's Isaac. Yep. And that God is going to multiply Right. The seed, so that the descendants of the seed are as numerous as the sands in the seashore, as numerous right. as the stars in the sky. Okay, so, you know, automatically, that's got to be talking about Isaac. That's the child of promise, right? Yep. Well, in one sense, but the ultimate child of promise is Jesus Christ, and his descendants are numbered as numerous as the sand on the sea because of his saving work, which that's includes right. both Jew and Gentile. Yep. And Galatians 3 tells us, that it's not talking about seeds, plural, but it's talking about seed, Jesus Christ. Yep, Galatians so, three sixteen. So if the if the first verse was if the first uh, prophecy was simply talking about Isaac, then you'd have Isaac and Jesus, which would be seeds. Right. It doesn't it doesn't work. It's no, seed. It, it's wonderful because it, it, Paul really puts the capstone on it. Galatians three twenty nine. He says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants or seed. His heirs according to the promise. In other words, the promise that was given to Abraham was a promise that not only it included Abraham's physical seed, but it included Abraham's spiritual seed, which was obviously uh, Jesus Christ, and then the descendants that came through that spiritual seed, those spiritual children of Abraham, you and I, brother, and the rest yeah. of the Christians there. That that Good stuff, man. Uh, it, I, it is I'm great gonna, stuff. I'm going to I'm gonna talk about this, like I said, in the weeks ahead. I'm going to let you go, Dustin, because uh, right. somebody was trying to call, and they it was ringing and ringing, and they gave up. So I'm going to drop you, and then uh, okay. they should uh, be able to get through now. If you, were, if you were calling on the 619 number, now is your opportunity. We've got about five minutes left. I've got enough time to get you in here. Uh, you know, this... What what Dustin and I were, were talking about, and what I was talking about previous to that, concerning this outline, uh, and if you tuned in late, I, you just do a search for, go to Google, do a search, the church is Israel now. And the very first hit you'll see on, on uh, that search is going to be an outline of themes in the Old Testament, and then uh, scripture to support those themes. And... You know, I, I was I was a dispensationalist. I came into the church 
started attending a dispensational church, started attending a dispensational school. And I didn't know that there was any other way to look at this. And, you know, a few years later, I keep saying, you know, I need to stop that. A few years later, I came to the realization that I was wrong on many issues. And not only was I wrong, but the people that were teaching me were wrong. So, you know, if you are, and there I, I said it again, if you are hearing this and you're rejecting this simply because it's contrary to what you've been taught, I think you need to, re- to rethink what you've been taught in light of the scriptures. Welcome to The Narrow Mind. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? This is Christian San Diego. Christian. What's going on, hey, my man? Uh, pretty good. How's it going? So, I got a question uh, about the... Um, I heard you go to a pretty good church. It's not bad. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Christian, that new... Christian goes to my church. Our church. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about the the interpretation of the millennial period, the kingdom, uh, the well, the millennial period. Mm-hmm. And um, I, uh, let me ask if I got the interpretation right of a uh, of a pre. I was I was pre mill, mm-hmm. but I have, to, I have to say you convinced me. <laughs> well, the scriptures convinced you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but the. Uh, at this time, when there's supposed to be the millennial period, um, there's going to be an there, there's going to be an uprising at that time, right? After the thousand years of that, correct, correct. Okay, well, actually, actually, not after. Toward the end of. Uh, right. Let me look at let me look at the the passage again. Uh, it's it, it's kind of general the way that it says. It says, until the thousand years were completed after these things, he must be relieved for a short time. So, yeah, I guess chronologically, you could get that it's after. Uh, but but we would hold, I would hold that it's it's simply saying that at the very end of the thousand years, whatever this period is, at the very end, there's going to be an uprising. Yeah, how, was it, how do they explain the the uprising? I mean, like, what, I thought we are going to have, I mean, some will have new bodies, and be sinless at this mm-hmm. time, right? Right. Well, well the well, uprising... He, he, you've asked an excellent question. And, and this is part of the problem with uh, a premillennial dispensationalism. You have, especially if you are... Let's say that you believe in a pre-trib rapture. So you've got a resurrection seven years before the millennium starts. It's a secret resurrection. It's, it's a resurrection. People are raised from the dead. Then you've got another resurrection seven years later... And that marks the beginning of the res- uh, of the uh, the beginning of the millennium. Then you've got a third resurrection that has to take place at the end of the thousand year period. So you've got you have to actually have three resurrections. Nowhere in Scripture are three resurrections spoken of. That's first of all. There are people. They say that there are people that survive the great tribulation that are not Christians. And they survive, I guess, the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, even though it says that the brightness of his coming is going to destroy them. Uh, They survive the second coming, and they enter into the millennial period for this thousand-year period. Okay. Now, so you, you have people living alongside, you have people with glorified bodies living alongside people with uh, natural bodies. So that, that's what you have. Well, they are, are, don't they hold that um, they, they don't survive the judgment? Because when Christ comes before and makes the millennial kingdom, there's, there's going to be a judgment at that point. So they would have to be believers. Well, they push that judgment off uh, another thousand years. They say that that's at the end of the thousand years. Okay, and then, and then those people will be the Satan bait. Exactly. Uprise. Those, yeah, the, that's the bad seed that makes it in. That's where the uprising comes from. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. It didn't when I heard it the first time. It still doesn't. I know that's that, that. Yeah, that's one of the the many problems that I kind of swept under the rug. Mm-hmm. What's your? T- what is this? Just an emotional thing that people hold on to? Uh, something to look forward to? What, what's your? Uh, what's the psychology behind the? The psychology, uh, it, it's hard to say what the psychology is. I think, uh, I don't know. I, I think that the, the psych, 
Well, it, it's what's been taught. And so when, when, you, when you ask the question about the psychology of believing something that is nowhere found in Scripture, where you have, for example, natural people living next to unnatural people, um, the psychology of believing that particular aspect of it is trying to force or, or trying to be consistent while maintaining a system that's unbiblical. And so you've got this, you've got this, this doctrinal grid that you begin with, the dispensational premillennial you know, view, and then everything else has to fit. So somebody like me comes along and says, well, where does the uprising come from? And all of a sudden now we've added on to that, or we have to incorporate in that belief system that there are those that make it into the millennium that are not saved. And so therefore they don't have glorified bodies. Well, how long are they going to, so they're going to live a thousand years then? Well, it depends on who you talk to. See, when I point out that you have to have three resurrections, uh, I've had one guy said, no, you don't have to have three resurrections because those that make it in, they survive the thousand-year period. I said, but they have natural bodies. And he says, I know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a better environment. And so they can live longer. It, it, so right, if, if you right, say that they right, die, right, I heard that, yeah. <laughs> if you say that they die, then you have to have another resurrection because they have to be raised to, to judgment. So no matter how you slice it or dice it, you, you, you got these tremendous problems. Well, people at, at this at, during the millennial kingdom, do people have kids? Well, that's another question. Um, it depends on who you talk to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I would think that they would have to. Obviously, we wouldn't be having kids because we got glorified bodies, and we're told that in the in the age to come, there's neither marriage nor those being given in marriage. Yeah, it's really strange. I, I thought that was a real good point too. We just got done listening, or we just got done listening to your um, your show, and your that, the guy's Tom from Virginia. Tom, okay, you're talking about yeah, you know, Tom. Tom from Virginia, and that was a real good point. You guys came up with. Uh, that you guys made about the um, the promises of land uh, that's going to be eternal, and then your count your guys counter was the um, well if this you know if we're going to have a new a new heavens and new earth that that the current land is temporal so yeah but that's my position the, <laughs> so he has to yeah. assume an aspect of my position to even argue against me which didn't make any sense whatsoever. Right. He calls up arguing that the, the land promises are unconditional. The land promises is that God is going to give them the land forever. I point out that, hey, wait a minute. God is going to destroy this earth and make a new one. So how is it that the land promises are forever? He says, well, the forever aspect is fulfilled in the eternal aspect of the new Jerusalem. Um, well, if that's the case, then why don't we just say that it's the new Jerusalem that fulfills the promise of being forever? And therefore, when it says, in, for example, in the book of Joshua, when it says that all of the Lord's promises, all of God's promises came to pass and not one of them failed, we definitely have a fulfillment. And we can say, yes, Joshua is speaking the truth to us because ultimately the promise was not about the boundaries and the land, the, the, the natural land, but it was about the land that was to come. Uh, that makes perfect sense. I mean, that's what makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm just a guy trying to figure out the scriptures. Well, you need to get a hold of MacArthur next. Uh, MacArthur's <laughs> got much better brains around him uh, than me that can try to convince him of this stuff with more credibility. So hopefully one of those guys will. But I do love John MacArthur in spite of, uh, in spite of his dispensationalism. So, That's right, yeah. Yeah, we're out of time. Christian, good talking to you. I'm glad okay. you called. Yep, I'll see you Thank Sunday. You. Bye. All right, bye. All right, folks, another edition of The Narrow Mind. Until next week, may the Lord bless the study of his word.